So yeah, nice to meet everybody, uh, just as far as introductions are concerned. So uh, I'm Sean Coco, Regional Sales Manager for Deep Instinct, and I'm here with my colleague, Jan Pohl, who's Senior Sales Engineer. So any technical questions, Jan is your man, and he'll be holding me accountable to make sure that uh, I stay honest throughout the presentation. So allow me to share my screen and we can kick this off. So there we go. We'll go to the start. Okay, right. So um, we are Deep Instinct, as you already know, and what we bring is a anti-malware prevention platform powered by deep learning. So we'll be elaborating all of that shortly, but really I want to take this back to the start and very, very simple question. Cybersecurity, what is it? Dumb question, but let's look at the two words. Cyber is you know, information technology and communication, while security is freedom from threats, safety, essentially. So when we look at the world of cybersecurity today, do we have more tools than 10 years ago? 100%. Are we safer than 10 years ago? Absolutely not. And I've got a few different articles here to elaborate on that. I mean, uh, the first one here, I think it's quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, Americans fear a cyber attack more than a nuclear attack. So it truly shows we're in fifth dimensional warfare. Some of these other articles elaborate on this as far as everyone, well, most big firms these days have an EDR, endpoint detection response, but these are not perfect. And the article on the right-hand side, let me get my laser pointer out. Um, this is shows that tools like ChatGPT can be tricked into breaching EDR. Um, CISOs are resigning around the board. Likewise, the same with cybersecurity teams. And 90% of businesses aren't ready for cyber attacks. And then on the le bottom left, we've got major breaches from 2023. Um, yeah, you can see that these figures are huge and they're increasing year on year. Um, Andres, I've seen that you've uh, rejoined. I'll continue and you'll carry on later, correct? I'll take the silence as yes. So, right. So everybody here already knows this massive problem. If we look at the history of how we even got to this point, well, a lot of uh, this here is actually before my time. But you can see that at the start of cybersecurity, when we had the first signature-based antiviruses, they had a preventive uh, rate of 98%, so very, very high. And really, as time went by, this truly dropped as attackers became smarter and there was just a lot more ways to exploit different tools. Really, from 2015 onwards, um, the industry made a shift where they figured that the threats were mutating so fast that true prevention was no longer possible. Hence, we moved into the realm of uh, detection and response, which by its very name and nature, it is reactive. It is implying that a threat has already entered the system. Hence, you're trying to stop it as quickly as possible. And there's a variety of tools which allow you to do that from EDRs, MDRs, XDRs, and uh, and others. So if we look at the fastest uh, ransomware in the world, it can start encrypting within 1.5 seconds and it starts spreading within three seconds. And then it can start infecting other computers within the network within 15 to 20 seconds. So you can see it is always a race against time when you're dealing with with such fast moving threats. And um, I, while the detection response, it is needed, it's also not good enough as we know from all of the cyber attacks that are happening right now. And really what we're trying to do at Deep Instinct is to move away from this entire reactive detection and response mentality, bringing back to true prevention. So if we look at the life cycle of, uh, of malware, a new malware is created. There's about 500,000 that are created per day. Uh, a mass infection happens. Then the, uh, the malware is analyzed and it's essentially reverse engineered to create create the features and the protection. And then via signature heuristics, machine learning, then these are programmed into the different cybersecurity softwares. But unfortunately, the cycle continues with this type of mentality, which is why breaches on the rise and solutions are struggling to keep up. These are some stats from the IBM security reports. 
you can see that the average cost of a breach and a ransomware attack is multi-millions, but possibly the most devastating is the time to remediate, 277 days. The amount of lost man hours, time, stress, really quite astronomical here. Hence, of course, we want to avoid breaches from happening. Uh, this gives a bit more details on some of the uh, attacks that have happened this year. And this is across the broad uh, uh, across the broad around the world all manner of industries companies governments i mean we've got massive names like abb run metal we've got multiple different hospitals um likewise with war happening in different countries like ukraine industrial style cyber attacks have taken down power grids hospitals which really is devastating and shows that cybersecurity is can actually be life threatening in these type of uh, in these type of use cases so um today what we're seeing is 72% of attacks are utilizing unknown malware so that is malware the world has never seen before as mentioned um this attack complexity and sophistication increases our ability to respond tails off. Hence, we need the right tools. But unfortunately, the tools are failing us because these attacks just continue to increase. And they're really ranging from ransomware, multi-stage supply chain attacks, zero days. And what's new and upcoming is adversarial AI, which we'll go into shortly. But due to the, uh, the attack frequency, this is also incre increasing the burden on SOC teams and likewise, very, very high false positive rates. So the the SOC teams are forever chasing ghosts, which is also burdening them down. So as far as the future is concerned, it's going to be even more dire, where besides ChatGPT, there are actually services to create your own malware like Fraud GPT and Worm GPT. So for a few hundred dollars a month, you can create as much malware as you'd like. And the fastest malware encrypts in 1.5 seconds a few months ago, it was three seconds. A few months time from now, it's going to be even quicker. So really, detection response is not going to be sufficient when we move into the future with AI mutating malware that is able to encrypt in record-breaking speeds. So where do we come in? Well, we have a predictive prevention platform that has the following uh, let's let's call, call them pros, uh, promises or ca company guarantees. This has a, we have a 99% prevention against unknown threats. So malware that is coming out in three months, six months, 12 months time, you still have this type of prevention. And the beauty is this actually works 100% offline. We don't need a cloud connection. We don't need constant updates. We actually only update the brain around twice per per year that is how good the technology is included with this is a false positive rate of 0.1 percent um other solutions one two five ten plus percent so this is absolutely tiny and really really reduces the the burden on stock teams and the prevention rate is in under 20 milliseconds so faster than the fastest malware can ever encrypt the beauty is that the prevention happens before a file is ever written to disk, before it's ever executed. What happens in all other solutions today is the file is actually written uh, is written on disk, and then only when it's opened, that is when uh, it will do some behavioral analysis and it will quarantine the file. We do all of this from the earliest possible moment in the attack chain. So the key question I'm sure everybody's asking is how on earth can we do this as these stats seem to be too good to be true. Well, they're all correct. We've got some tests we will show you from live customer um, POVs and real life customers are using this technology. But the simple yet not simple answer is we're utilizing deep learning technology. So what is deep learning? So Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of AI. So AI is really a broad term as far as computers that have some type of thinking ability. And um, deep learning is, let's say, the highest level of AI that we have today. So all other solutions right now are using machine learning, which had its time as far as being effective. But as, as years go by, it's proving a lot less so. Um, really, what you see in some of the 
biggest and best tech companies, they're all utilizing deep learning as well. Down here, it's probably a bit small for anyone to see it, but some um, examples of deep learning utilizations would be self-driving cars, uh, Google, when you can just type in a word in your images and it will, it will find you all the images with that particular word. So th this is um, really at the forefront of technology right now. Um, the key difference with machine learning is with machine learning, you need a human input. You need a feature engineer um, as opposed to deep learning, where it's all autonomous and is utilizing 100% of available data. Well, with machine learning, you're only ever able to take a subset of data to create that feature to then create your program. Let's humanize this in a slightly different way. So. Um, I have two children and neither of them speak yet, but of course, uh, as a child, they're being bombarded by information and they're learning about the world and their neural network is being created. Deep learning is essentially an artificial neural network. Um, so taking this example of the little boy and the cat and the dog. So over the course of many years, he's going to get a huge amount of exposure to different cats and different dogs. And at some point, he will be able to differentiate between the two without even being able to describe what makes this a dog and what makes this a cat. And that, that's really the same with all of us right now. You'll see a husky, you'll see a chihuahua, you'll know what it is, and you'll probably know the breed. But what if somebody asked you to describe it? That's going to be extremely difficult. And no matter how much time you're given and how detailed you are, you're never ever going to be able to describe it in 100% accuracy. That is really the core difference between machine learning and deep learning. And if we also take the this uh, this type of image here, so there's a variety of chihuahuas and there's a variety of blueberry muffins. It is nearly impossible for a machine learning algorithm to be able to differentiate between these. You as humans, you can look at this and you know straight away what it is, which is partially why a lot of websites have those different security tests to check that you're human. With deep learning, it is able to differentiate between these two. So to elaborate a little bit more on what I've just spoken about, deep learning on average uses less than 2% of available data, uh, machine learning, 2%. Deep learning uses 100% of all raw data. Um, machine learning requires human input. Deep learning is 100% autonomous and self-learning. And then when it comes to file types, machine learning is relatively limited, while deep learning is actually able to be used with all file types. And what this means is um, the false positive rate here, it says 1% to 2%, but in real life, it can be a lot higher. And then when it comes to unknown threats, the unknown malware, uh, we've done a lot of testing and it is confirmed. On average, 50 to 70 percent uh, accuracy against unknown threats, as opposed to a deep learning algorithm, where less than 0 0.1 percent false positives, and over a 99 percent accuracy against unknown threats. So, this is quite cliche, but the Americans love it. Fight, fight AI with AI. Of course, in the world that we're living with, where AI threats are increasing the risk profile. Everyone will need their own benign AI to automate that defense for you. To delve a little bit more into some of the extra aspects on the slide, I mentioned already uh, we never write to disk. It's not reliant on heuristics of censure, and there is no threat intelligence feeds required either. That means that customer data never ever leaves their environment. It is all done locally. Therefore, if you actually want to be using this technology 100% offline, that is completely uh, that is completely doable. And we have customers in def the defense industry and certain governments that are using this 100% offline as well. Um, and yeah, really, as far as the, the model is, uh, is concerned, it is extremely resilient, which is why we only need the two updates per year. And even without those updates, yeah, it still works very, very well. Um, we uh, we had examples where an agent wasn't updated for more than 12 months, and it was still able to stop over 99% of malware that were downloaded that day. When my colleague Jan gives you a quick demo, you will also see that 
his agent was last updated in May, and the threats he is going to bombard it with were downloaded today. So really quite impressive as far as how it can work 100% offline. Uh, likewise, any of these slides, if you want to view them in more detail, I'll be happy to share them as well at the end of the uh, presentation. So um, of course, the key question is, all of these different attacks that we've witnessed over the many years, could Deep Instinct have prevented them? Well, the answer is yes. When a attack uh, an attack happens, we, of course, go to a laboratory, model it, and test it on an older brain to double check could we have stopped it. In the rare example that we don't stop it, of course, we train the brain and then we'll update all the brains to make sure that they're that they're protected. But as mentioned, it's over a 99% prevention capability. So these three very big attacks in particular, everyone may remember the colonial pipeline that was shut down for multiple days in May 2021. Well, back in May 2021, we tested this and we could have stopped it with our technology. And that's not just for ransomware, that is also for, uh, for zero day attacks and for other types of uh, vulnerabilities as well. So really, if you want to be protected today, in the future, for attacks 12 months from now, this type of technology is essential because uh, it, it has been proven. We are not constantly needing to update it like all other technologies out there because signature heuristics, machine learning, they, they, they will always need to have updates to stay on top of modern type of threats. Um, I mentioned before, as far as efficacy tests, so these are some examples of different vendors, and these were done in an online type of capability. So um, even when they were connected to the internet, you can see that with two of these vendors, they weren't amazing. The third one here did actually uh, quite well, but as soon as the internet was connected for a few days, you can imagine that all of these dropped off besides our own. Whether it's online or offline, it actually doesn't make any difference as far as the efficacy is uh, is concerned. So um, as mentioned, current solutions are reactive and that increases the burdens on the SOC teams as they're forever hunting ghosts with false positives and um, just being overburdened with alerts. And this is the case whether you have an internal or an external SOC. So we want to move away from being reactive. We're trying to be as proactive as possible. So one of the benefits of this technology is due to stopping nearly all threats, the burden on the SOC team can be lowered from 30 to 50, sometimes even higher percent. So you can imagine that is a massive cost saving and a massive time saving for the team as well. So who are we? Uh, <laughs> who is this company that is making the, these crazy type of um, uh, statements? So we were founded in 2015. We've got headquarters in Tel Aviv, New York and London, Tokyo, and um, the team is dispersed around the world. Um, our investors include Black, BlackRock, PayPal, NVIDIA, and some of the biggest companies out there. And we have multiple different uh, patents on our technology and uh, industry recognition. To delve a little bit more into the brains behind the operation, well, the three main individuals I'd like to tell you about. So firstly, uh, the CEO is Lane Bess. He is the former CEO of Zscaler and Palo Alto Networks. Um, he is a multi-billionaire. He retired. Um, he was living on his yachts in uh, Miami, and he came out of retirement to run this company. That is how excited he is about the technology. Carl Froggett, um, he is our CIO, the former global CISO of Citibank. Um, once again, he tested this technology extensively. He onboarded it at City, and then we managed to uh, to po poach him. And once again, uh, 24 years at, at Citibank, 16 years as global C, so, so really at the forefront of cybersecurity. And then lastly, uh, we have Shimon here, and I'll mention our founder as well, Guy Caspi. Um, all of the, uh, let's say, techie brains of the operation, they're in Tel Aviv, and what they have in common is they all have military um, backgrounds, all part of cyber defense units. So they were using deep learning technology to predict and prevent missiles, 
coming into Israel. And really, they took this type of deep learning technology used by the Iron Dome system to create this uh, this cybersecurity company. Hence, now they're able to accurately predict and prevent uh, malware. So before we go a bit more into the products that we have, um, I just want to highlight as far as why now? Well, we already talked about how the threat landscape right now is bad and it's going to continue to get worse. And incumbent solutions are using older technology and this technology will always be playing catch up. So really, as far as the peace of mind of everybody is concerned, um, this technology is essential. Um, if you remember the first article I showed about the uh, CISOs leaving the industry in, in, uh, in swarms, I, I mean, that that's the thing. Cybersecurity teams are under huge amounts of pressure, and this is why they need this type of preventive technology to really understand that, yes, the business is safe and secure. Involved with this is, of course, reducing risk. This is the only technology where you can be certain that malware that will be out in the future, you'll be protected against. Likewise, this is, of course, going to reduce your vendor and staff churn and lower the burden on SOC teams. And one of the key bits here is data. We, we don't train on any customer data, and therefore, data never, ever leaves the customer environment. Hence, you'll always be compliant and make sure customer data is uh, secure. Um, besides uh, these two aspects, there's actually multiple different ways that our clients were reducing their costs. Of course, we have the uh, the AV Sandbox EPP replacement that is you know a way of tool consolidation. But besides that, well, due to lowering the SOC alerts, uh, this will lower, of course, the the uh, the cost of SOC. So. If it's an external stock and you're paying for a package or a ticket, you can, of course, downgrade that, so massively reducing that. Or if uh, if you have an internal stock, well, your team is going to be more efficient and not being burdened down by the alerts. Uh, by the alerts. Um, with the majority of EDR vendors out there, we know that a lot of their revenue is actually from uh, – additional services up to 50%. So it's not just a matter of you buying their solution, you're paying for services through your, ear, through your ears um, indefinitely. That is not the case with ourselves. In, in some ways, um, <laughs> when we speak with people and we show a demo, it's so quick and easy. It's not really as exciting as other solutions are out there just because it truly is prevention. It doesn't have all of the bells and whistles of uh, of what an EDR will uh, bring. That said, we can work with any EDR because we are not an EDR. We will elaborate on that. The final aspect here, which is quite interesting. So the CPU and RAM utilization of deep learning technology is extremely low. Um, it is on average about 50% lower, both in use and at rest versus an antivirus, meaning there's a lot of cost saving that can be found on server or endpoint utilization just due to um, not having to burden down the machines uh, with this technology. So this is the uh, the holistic overview of um, where we see Deep Instinct slotting in, where whatever the weak points are on the um on the organization, this is where we're going to try and help them to fill fill the gaps. So um, we do not have products for all of these different aspects, but they will be coming out. What we will be talking about today is endpoints, storage, and applications. That said, though, via the application side, we can actually link to a lot of SaaS and cloud storage as well. So it, it's very versatile. Um, so these are the three products, which I'll elaborate on shortly. They're all linked to a management console. This is normally hosted in the cloud, and this is where we will do, be doing the model updates, and you'll be able to be uh, do the different um, uh, aspe aspects of, uh, of management. But even though it is normally hosted in the cloud, there is there are options to have this on-premise. And... I mentioned before defense. So the UK MOD is using this technology and they're using it 100% offline. So yeah, no cloud connection whatsoever. So firstly, uh, DPS, this is the very first product. Well, sorry, this is 
uh, the newest product in our portfolio is actually not out yet. It will be released in the next uh, few weeks. We have a webinar planned on that if anyone would like to join. But um, right now with storage, there's a massive gap in the market. When we speak with prospects, half of them say that they're not doing full scans anymore because it is just too slow, IT intensive. And um, the other half that are, uh, as mentioned, it's extremely slow and it's very, very um, heavy on the uh, on the, on the machine. So, what we're bringing out is a native integration with Dell and NetApp. Pure storage is coming out soon, and then this will also be working with AWS S3 with other clouds coming out in the future. And similar to what we spoke about earlier, um, files are scanned in less than twenty milliseconds with this extremely high efficacy. This means you'll be able to do full scans again. And what's really important is there is a lot of uh, malware that can reside within uh, storage. And really, if you were to move a file from one storage to another, this could be catastrophic, as was the case with Cloud Nordic, where they were moving to another service Malware got moved over and it encrypted all of their backups and they've lost all of their data because they were not willing to pay the ransom. So this is really going to fill a massive uh, niche because uh, things like antiviruses, they miss uh, novel, mal uh, novel malware and yeah, they're just, uh, just too slow and cumbersome. So deep instinct for applications. This is um, probably the most versatile product that we have as the storage and endpoint solution is an agent. This is agentless. So to elaborate on all of that shortly, you can see that two fifths of malware downloads are in malicious office documents. And may, all of the solutions out there will usually let, let the file write to disk, execute, and then they will quarantine it, which overall is a very risky strategy to be doing. So. When it comes to files, um, millions are being moved around internally, externally, with partners, between customers. And as is often the case, there might be no scanning that is happening. Or if it is, they're using the following three solutions. So we mentioned antiviruses before. Um, they miss novel malware. They're very intensive. And they require frequent updates, um, whether it's daily, weekly, not the case with deep learning. With sandboxes, it takes a few minutes per file. Um, so once again, very slow, not scalable at all if you're dealing with massive amounts of files. And then when it comes to CDRs, well, they actually um, destroy legitimate content within files. Um, so not great if you're dealing with something like an e-signature. Uh, and that's not the case with ourselves at all. So how does it look? It is essentially um integratable to anything via a restful api or icap and it is a dockerized container which uh, which can be on premise or it can be wherever you'd like it to be and um this means it is extremely flexible and you could link it to um any manner of services whether it be email attachments or maybe uh, web gateways where you have customers uploading, downloading, or maybe a partner port portal where files are being exchanged. Or um, one of our biggest uh, customers is Citibank. So they are actually using this for 270 different custom applications. Uh, and what's interesting is the throughput is 280 gigabytes per hour per Docker, meaning millions of files per day, no problem at all. And you could run multiple Dockers if you have crazy type of uh, requirements. And not to mention, this covers all file types as well. Some examples are right here. As mentioned, if you want to delve into this in more detail, we will share this content with you. And of course, if you want to demo on this, uh, Jan, can organize it. But for today, we will cover more the uh, endpoint agent. And just to elaborate a bit more, um, here we have the predictive prevention hub. And as mentioned, you can link this to whatever you wish, uh, as long as it can be using API or ICAP. As another example of utilization of this, there was a German company that had a breach last year, 
they weren't using Deep Instinct, uh, as you can imagine. Now, their consultant said it was going to take them six months to transfer the uh, the compromised uh, files over to the uh, the new service. So they got in touch with us. We worked with them. It took four weeks for this file transfer to happen. So really quite astonishing as far as how quick uh, this was able to be done with uh, Deep Instinct for applications. Uh, as another example here, we have both WeTransfer and Box as uh, as customers. So when it came to WeTransfer, <clears throat> they're, of course, dealing with um, huge numbers of files and neither antiviruses nor sandboxes were doing the job for them. When they were testing this out, they ran 35 million files, sorry, 15 million files through it, and they found 38 false positives. So that is 0. 0.00 lessons. Yeah, I, I don't have a calculator, but you, you can imagine it's tiny, very, very low false positive rate, extremely scalable. So now both of these file transferring services are using DPA to ensure that the billions of files that they're dealing with are protected. And they're using this on, on public cloud. But in the example of Citibank, they are using this on premise. So yeah, it's completely up to yourselves on how you'd like to be using this. And then uh, that brings us on to DPE. So um, I will shortly pass it on to Jan so he can show you what does it look like? How does it actually stop this type of malware? Um, but as mentioned, it is, a, it is a solution installed locally on the agent, or it can be installed on the server, or it can be installed on mobile devices as well. And as mentioned before, prevents malware in 20 milliseconds. It's extremely lightweight. And the management console can also be, uh, be integrated to different EDRs, XDRs. And uh, I suppose uh, to, to also mention, when we talk about EDR and the deployment, it usually is a year-long process. It's, uh, it takes a long time to deploy. With ourselves, depending on the size of the organization, it can be done within weeks. If we're talking about a massive government, then it's going to take a few months. But the deployment is a lot easier and simpler than, than an EDR. So I mentioned Citibank. Another example is uh, is Barclays. So they were moving over to Defender and they wanted to double check, is just Defender good enough? And um, on testing, they found, no, it wasn't. I will elaborate a little bit more uh, on that uh, shortly. But interestingly enough, they actually found a cost saving of 9.5 mil here. And that came from um, less time spent on investigating threats, less uh, downtime as far as endpoint fatigue, and then, of course, lowered uh, SOC alerts as well. And just to elaborate a little bit more on the testing, um, we've got a slide on that. So um, they're using Defender as an EDR. We're a plus one on top. So they bombarded both with 600 malicious files. So this was during the POV. So firstly, they ran it online. So you can see even online Defender missed a fair bit and offline it missed a lot. Uh, and that was as opposed to ourselves, where in this particular test, we stopped 100%. But of course, that's not always the case, hence we say <laughs> over 99%. Um, so yeah, we're being used as a plus one on top for, for Barclays. And that is the case for most of our clients as well. And we can work with any EDR vendor, really just improving their preventative capabilities and then lowering the alerts as well. That is my section done. So... I have been speaking for a very long time. Hopefully there are multiple questions. So let's answer these questions and then we will pass it over to Jan. Um, Andreas, maybe uh, if you want to uh, read the questions and then uh, finish off what you were talking about before. I can see the question, so I would... Um... Uh, give it. So the first question is how this solution influenced XDRs and their threat frameworks. It's a good question. Um, we see in 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 the uh, landscape out there with our competitors 
Um, they are using their technology, of course, with signature heuristics and mis machine, uh, machine learning based uh, solutions uh, to uh, prevent malware. And um, they put a lot of managed service into it because we heard EDR is not enough and they know um, all the signal signals uh, are overwhelming the companies out there. So what we can what can we do? We uh, provide more managed service to earn more money from uh, from the, our customers, of course. And uh, how it changed that? I would say uh, even companies um, can save money with our solution because we can reduce uh, the the signals uh, with our solution because we have our false positive rate uh, less than uh, zero point one uh, percent, like Sean already said to us. Um, but uh, we are focusing on the malware prevention. When we when you think about XDR, uh, we do not um, um, look for, for example, uh, network signals. We can scan uh, files in transfer over the network, of, of course, but we do not uh, see something um, what what an EDR would uh, looking for for behavior analysis, for example. We can do behavior analysis, but all ma uh, ma malware ba based, not, uh, for example, um, traditionally, an EDR would um, create a signal when I type in "Who am I," but it's not malicious by 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 design. Just an example given. So what we can do, we reduce um, the signals uh, and reduce the the costs in the company. I hope uh, this uh, answers the question. Um, second question. Um, how other vendors are dealing with deep learning in their platform's products. They do not use deep learning uh, so far. They are using machine learning, even when they told you uh, they're using deep learning. Could be that they use deep learning, but more for in a generative um, AI deep learning way, for example, like ChatGPT, but not for malware prevention. And even more, um, we use deep learning uh, for, for example, PE files, Office files, uh, PDF files, um, PowerShell code, JavaScript code, and so on. So we have a lot of deep learning algorithm to prevent malware, um, what uh, other competitors are not doing. Uh, even when they're using machine learning, mostly they use heuristics or a signature, for example, for PDF or for Office files, and um, they are focusing the machine learning, code, machine learning code just for PE files. Um, but we have to say, deep learning is the future. And I think the, the other uh, competitors, they know that. So when we look in the future, maybe uh, between three and five years in the future, I assume that the uh, that our competitors um, are using deep learning as well. But the fact that we are using it now, we are still today, five years um, uh, in front of our customers with our technology and our knowledge um, how to prevent uh, malware with deep learning. The third question, uh, which deep learning algorithm is the technology built on? So that's a really good question as well. We built our own deep learning algorithm. Um, here, maybe you think uh, for TensorFlow from Google, for example, uh, which you can use for your specific case. But we designed our own deep learning algorithm, which is patent um, to prevent malware. So when we think for TensorFlow, it's a good base for something. But we uh, we have a focused deep learning algorithm to prevent malware based on scanning the binary files. So um, we have our own framework for that, our own deep learning algorithm, not a common one, which can be used for everything, but nothing that is good when you focus on. Um, and based on that, we extend our, our file types, of course, continuously. And we uh, cover with our deep learning algorithm today already a lot of files, the common common use case, uh, all of that. And like I said, even uh, the fileless attacks, for example, PowerShell or JavaScript or something like that. I hope um, this um, question answered, uh, the, this answer uh, answered the question that way. <laughs> um, that's all for now. If you have further questions during my demo now, please uh, type it into it. And um, I will see what I can do for you. Okay, I'm 
sharing my screen now and um, I will present our DPE product uh, for you. Our DPE product is based on the uh, deep learning algorithm I already uh, told you. And what you can see today in our DPE product, these deep learning algorithm is based in all of our products. So Sean uh, told you something about deep instinct for endpoint. This is the, uh, the this is the little agent, the little lightweight agent you can see here. But all the uh, deep learning algorithm he is using, it's the same in our deep instinct uh, prevention for application, which is the, the in transit scanner. Um, it can be uh, used uh, via RESTful API or via the ICAP protocol. So uh, every kind of file type which you can uh, scan in transit before it reaches to your uh, IT infrastructure. And in uh, our upcoming DPS product, Deep Instinct Prevention for Storage, where we want to prevent uh, incoming uh, files or malicious files um, uh, to your storage. Here we use, of course, the same one. So we extend our product line continuously based on our um, proven uh, deep learning algorithm. Um, so again, what you can see here, it's based in all of our products. It's the same. Um, OK, let's start. You can see here, I build a machine and uh, the last communication with our um, uh, management console and even with the, with the internet was in May. So um, we, we are still, we are already in version five, for example. But what I did, uh, I downloaded yesterday uh, some malware examples from VirusTotal. Uh, so we have here, for example, 31 Office files, which includes doc, docx, xls, uh, and xlsx files, PDF files, 100, and PE files, 685, um, uh, 80, 85. And we have here about 190 megabyte of files. What I'm doing now is I will copy all that files. So um, about how many I said about uh, da, 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 816 files to my desktop. And we will see how fast we can prevent all that files without any executed execution. So we are um, we are we can detect all uh, malicious uh, content in a pre-executed way. So no execution, no signal, better for the SOC team. What we uh, do else is we are looking to uh, our task manager. So in the idle mode, we consumed uh, about 100 megabytes and 0% uh, uh, CPU rate. And when I'm starting to copy the files now, we can see that during the scan, during the prevention, it increased maybe about 200, 250 megabytes and maybe between 30 and 50% CPU rate, but only for the short time uh, where our uh, D client, our agent prevents all that malware. So 900, uh, 190 megabytes and around 800 files. So let's start. Maybe I copy it again. Or my keyboard is, doesn't work. Maybe that way. Paste. So uh, you can yeah. see it's it starts and nothing happened at the target folder because we are on a pre-execution level. 50% 50, 50 CPU rate and about 90 megabytes uh, memory. Um, and after about maybe 20, 25 seconds, it's done. We see directly into it. It's an empty folder. Nothing happened. So we prevented in that short time new malware, which downloaded yesterday, first seen yesterday on a machine which is um, that is connect disconnected from the internet since May. So I would say that's that's uh, it's a really really uh, good proven for for our technology. And let's go to a more um, more common world example. So we all know that most malware uh, arise through through Outlook, through the internet, when uh, one of our customer sees an, a new email, oh, uh, Amazon Business, yeah, could be could be uh, created from, from myself or, or from my uh, manager. So, okay, let's see registration, Amazon Business, double click on it. 
operation failed because we prevented it uh, in a pre-execution level. So even when I uh, go to the next mail from Office 365, for example, the spam report, and I uh, want only see it in preview, we prevented it because we do not want to uh, load this report in our memory and something happened because all the signals that would be happened from memory or something else means something a signal always means something happened in my infrastructure with our solution we prevent it we generate the event from the uh, prevention but no further signals so let's do it with with our uh, other um examples very quick so even the uh, pdf file it's prevented and my internet explorer or my edge browser uh, cannot find the file because it's already gone into into quarantine and the last one uh, when i um, look here again into preview word file it's prevented so you can keep your endpoint uh, completely clean against malware so now we have seen um, malware prevention uh, live with an since um, may disconnected uh, pc and a common example uh, for example, with um, with uh, incoming mails, mails, uh, but it could be, for example, in a connected USB stick uh, as well, where we prevent uh, all these kinds of malware um, before it executed. Uh, where will it send? So we have here a management console. This is our management console, and here. You can collect all uh, events and configure all um, policies to, for your uh, infrastructure. And all of our product products um, are using this management console. So you do not have different kind of management console per product. You have one management console for each product. product. So very important when, you, when I uh, click into um, the events, I see all the prevented uh, malware. In my case, it's of course a lot because it's my daily business uh, to copy malware from A to B in uh, efficacy tests, for example, or in demos like today. So when I um, um, look into one here, for example, malware ransomware, I think, oh, that could be interesting. I see all the metadata uh, that, that were uh, uploaded to my management console. And this is very important. We would never upload a file from your infrastructure in our management console. The only thing what you can see here um, is the metadata from the event itself. So what we can see here is, for example, the file hash from the specific file we prevented. We see here a short process chain. Of course, it's uh, short because it's prevented. Um, you see uh, our, our brain prevented us. Threats are relatively very high. And um, the origin uh, path, file path size or in what kind of file path and very interesting as well we see here um the the specification or on, on what based uh our deep learning algorithm is thinking it should be prevented or it, it had prevented so by 88 percent it's a ransomware by eight percent is a virus two percent is a dropper one percent is a spyware sometimes you can see for example here let me pick another one it's by 100% dropper, so he is very, very sure. But based on the binary um, he's uh, looking for, uh, he made uh, his uh, decision and prevent all kinds of malware, even if it's not uh, written yet. So what have, what have we uh, else here? We have some uh, metadata about the event and from the from the endpoint itself that the administrator or the SOC team knows. Okay, um, the device name is the stage uh, W10 staging machine uh, with the following device ID, what kind of platform uh, and OS and IP address. Decline version, version dbrain, dbrain means our deep learning algorithm and so on, what kind of policy and so on, but nothing else. So, which means no sandbox, which is very slow and collects data maybe. We do not um, um, calculate our deep learning algorithm with your data, already uh, Sean said that. Um, and we upload just metadata to this console, uh, nothing else. It's very important, uh, like other vendors, um, upload a whole file into a cloud to a sandbox environment, for example, 
or for further analysis to training the all algor uh, machine learning algorithm and uh, extend uh, the, the, the Intel, which is learning from you to the own um, intelligence to defend further malware, maybe for other com um, customers they have. But in our case, we have a finished training, trained uh, deep learning algorithm. And uh, when we bring a new version, for example, out um, to, to our uh, customers, it's it's mostly we extended uh, our our brain to for example a new file type so we saw in the in the past that um, the threat le threat landscape extends um into direction like lnk files so what what did we do we extended our um our algorithm with detecting lnk files so this is this is mostly when we uh, bring a new update uh, to our customer what's what's inside that brain because we already detect 99% uh, uh, um, malware and uh, up more than a 99% and this this is what it's in, uh, what's included uh, in in the new um, brain so this was a short introduction a, a short demo um, from from our endpoint product um, our dps uh, product works nearly the same. It's tightly integrated into, uh, um, for now, Dell and NetApp management um, uh, servers. Here we have a certified um, agent, uh, which scans modified new new file creation and so on. Uh, as soon our the, the Dell or the NetApp um, management knows that. So he, we, are, uh, we are working tightly with the, these vendors together that we have those clients, a certified client uh, for, for all that my word uh, prevention. And then transit scanner, that's uh, very interesting as, as well because um, our DPA product, you can use it wherever you want to. Uh, you just need an ICAP protocol or a RESTful API. Um, and here you don't need really a management console anymore because um, in case of, of RESTful API, you send it through, you receive a, race, a JSON response and all of that kind of uh, information, it's inside the JSON response. And based on that, you can decide whatever you want to do with your file. For example, put it into quarantine or bring it into uh, a quarantine folder, send it to all your employees if you uh, want to have your time, for example, just kidding um but you don't need really uh, a management console anymore and uh, with do one docker container we can scan up to 288 gigabyte per hour and of course you can uh, increase it by uh, when when you use it in a cluster um here we support uh, docker kubernetes and openshift um and if you're interested in one of these uh, technology we are happy to schedule another demo um where we can dig dig a little bit deeper but i think for now um it's a good overview how our product is working um how our prevention is working um we are going one step further we make predictive prevention why we can prevent malware uh which is not written yet for example uh even uh, evil GGPT or warm GPT. Um, it's uh, the way where the threat, threat landscape is going to. We can prevent it uh, before it's executed, before it generates a signal uh, and reduce the, the burden from the SOC team. Okay. Uh, I think there are new two questions. Uh, could you elaborate how does the algorithm, algorithm actually understands if the file is malware or not? How is it done so fast? What parameter I looked at? Okay, um, this is mainly the, the difference between machine learning and, and deep learning. So we scan just the binary files. And um, for example, a machine learning uh, algorithm is trained very fast with less data. You can train a machine learning uh, algorithm, for example, with 10,000 10, data or 100,000 data. A deep learning um, algorithm is based on billions of data. So for example, 500 uh, billion files um, uh, we put into say, okay, this training cycle, you you get uh, benign files and the next uh, cycle you, you get uh, malicious files. And based on that, um, the, 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 the deep learning algorithm can look for the specificas um, they have to looking for. They can compare the, 
between benign files and malicious files. Of course, we say this is ma uh, malicious PE files and this is benign PE files and another completely new algorithm is based for office files, for example. So each file type has its own deep learning algorithm. And um, based on that, we, we can uh, detect uh, that fast um, a, a malicious content because we just scan it it's offline. It's completely uh, up to the resources from, from the endpoint. Don't need any cloud connection, no upload, no sandbox. It's just the little lightweight agent, the deep learning algorithm in it. And uh, the way that's finished, that's the way why, why we do it that fast. I hope uh, this is answering uh, your question. And the last one. Does your agent have uh, protection from stopping or deleting? Um, I mean, you you are speaking from ransomware, as I think. Yes, of course, um, because ransomware is basically malware, uh, and um, here we detect a malware before it's executed. So Sean said it already: the fastest malware is one point five seconds, um, and we can stop the malware in a pre-execution level in. 20 milliseconds or less. So way before it's executed, way before something happened, way before a file is uh, encrypted. And so we we can stop the ransomware, stop the encryption before it's uh, started. Um, and that's the way we are, how we do it. So the answer is yes. All right. New questions. Is there any sort of dynamic analysis uh, the system uh, can do? Yes, we have um, three layers. So we have a multi-layer approach. We have the static analysis. What you can see here, yeah, this is based on uh, scanning the file, uh, the, the file binaries by 100% to detect malware in the pre-execution level. But um, of course, we know, all know uh, there are fileless attacks as well. So we have even for PowerShell or for uh, JavaScript, for example, deep learning algorithm. Um, if you have, for example, uh, a RIG attack, which based uh, on on a, a PowerShell attack, so what, what downloads you um, at the end, a RIG ransomware, we can see based on the PowerShell code itself what will be happened and can prevent it in a fileless uh, state. What we have as well, we have uh, in our policy, for example, um, here, uh, behavior analysis for the second line of defense, everything what happened in, in, in memory, um, we, we can prevent it, uh, of course, as well. And we extend this uh, behavior analysis uh, lineup um, um, constantly. For example, um, uh, in version 5, we added two further uh, in-memory protection layers. Uh, where we can stop malware um, in in a in memory based uh, uh, attack. Very important here. Um, maybe uh, com combined to these questions, uh, what we else have? We have um, because even even we have to exclude something in a system. For example, SQL exchange or something else. Like other vendors uh, do it as well or um, have to do it as well. Um, but we divided it into. Uh, a two-tier exclude. So we have the exclusion. That's what the others uh, do do as well. Here we we um, um, uh, turn off the static analysis and the uh, behavior analysis. But we always say try to do it to put it into the allow list because the allow list turns off the static analysis but keeps the behavior analysis uh, turned on. Just an example, I have here my file path, for example, um, the C tools. In the C tools uh, folder was the source folder where I um, had my, my malware put into. Uh, from that source folder, I copied it into my uh, non-allow listed desktop folder. So in that way, I could demonstrate my malware because the static analysis is turned off. But when I have this, when I have a, a ransomware, for example, in that folder, we have here an, an um, ransomware behavior uh, here, ransom beh behavior uh, tool for the in-memory protection. So even if I have a allow listed folder and a ransomware folder, a ransomware file would placed in that allow listed folder, we can prevent it. So with our in-memory protection, we see the change of uh, the entities 
um, uh, and uh, can can uh, prevent uh, those attacks in two ways: static analysis and the behavior analysis. So the in-memory protection, and even if we have a low listed folder or something else, we prevent the the endpoint uh, two with our in-memory protection because it's still switched on um, via the allow listed pass. Something else, companies who make telemetry solutions for security, are they on wrong path? Um, uh, yeah, I would say yes, of course, because deep learning is the new shit of uh, preventing malware. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for my words. But um, I mean, we we are uh, a company bay, uh, which from, I think we started 2015 and many of these companies um, was, was uh, created, I don't know, in the 80s, in the early thousands. And so they built up their whole technology based on signatures, uh, heuristics. Then it came out uh, malware, uh, malicious, uh, machine learning. And the step from going to machine learning into deep learning is very cost incentive. So we we have the we had the luck that um, we started with with deep uh, deep learning. So we didn't have the cost um, before world uh, deep, before the deep learning world because you need a lot of GPU powers. So what what we did we um, booked a lot of um, VMs, uh, GPU based, uh, and it's very, very, very cost incentive. So I think the burden from a lot of these companies um, are still the costs because you need good knowledge people, which is uh, with good knowledge deep learning uh, people and um, the the costs for, for the uh, huge, huge amount of uh, GPUs uh, out there to uh, learn it, to, to, to train your deep learning algorithm. So I think these two facts um, are for now the, um, the, the stopper for, for all that companies. And like I said, I think in the next, uh, between two, three and five years, um, you will see more companies they are, they, that they are switching from their old machine learning into the new deep, deep learning um, world. But like I said, um, we are way before that. We have five, even now, five years more uh, knowledge about that kind of technology like our uh, our competitors. Other questions? I would say well, let's wait two minutes and I mean, if you have uh, questions after you uh, see the uh, presentation slides again, or you have new questions uh, after our call, um, you can write us an email. We are happy to answer them um, if you want to schedule a, a, a demo where we can dig a little bit deeper on what we uh, love to do. Um, we, we want to prove our value, our added value to you. So, I mean... All these beautiful marketing slides, that's, that's, it looks nice, it looks cool, it had new, uh, the new design, I like that. We have, before that, we had a, we have a, another one, but we are happy to, to prove our added value, just not just in slides and uh, this nice demo. We want to bring it uh, to you that you can choose what, what do you want to test with our solution? Is it really better than our uh, current one? And uh, what we love to uh, to make a fixity test, for example, uh, to your current uh, solution, or you you want to test, uh, I don't know, copy and malware uh, again in in your environment, or we we bring our environment with. We can do that as well in our proof of value, where we want to bring the added value to you, um, and you can test it uh, within weeks with a, a success plan, what you want to test and uh, to um, prove that, that we are not saying some marketing something. To, I... to add to what Jan said, I mean, don't take our word for it, test it, and you'll see that this is miles ahead of everything else out there. Every POV we've done has been a technical win. <laughs>